Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Well, I hope you've come and joined us with a cup of coffee or a glass of water or whatever to sit and relax and hear another story of someone whose heart and mind were opened by the Holy Spirit to a deeper walk with Christ in His church. So thank you for joining us on the program. Our guest tonight is Michael Kress. A long list, former Church of God, agnostic, Episcopal, but we'll find out the details of the journey. Michael, welcome to the Thanks journey. Thanks for home. having me. It's good to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. And we have common friend and good old Dr. Ken Howell, who's right. been on the program many times. Mm -hmm. uh, You'll hear about that tonight. Yeah. Well, good. Well, let me get out of the way and sure. invite you to take us back to the beginning. Well, I was raised uh, as a preacher's kid, PK. Uh, for the first oh, many years no. of my life, I didn't absolutely. Know I was having to <laughs> <laughs> my father was in full-time ministry when I was younger, and uh, he was ordained at the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana. Oh, sure. Right, and the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, is doesn't like the term denominational. Right. It's much more uh, a movement. Um, there's no formal membership, as far as I can recall, and it's just the, you know the Bible and being open to the Holy Spirit, but not really speaking in tongues or anything like that. It was just pretty laid back and come together to worship God. Mm -hmm. So I grew up, uh, we were born in Pennsylvania, moved to Canton, Ohio, so not too far from here. And my first memories were in Canton, Ohio of living in, I guess you'd call it the parsonage, right, right. next door to the church. We'd cross the gravel driveway <laughs> to go to, to worship in the morning. So those are my first memories. Uh, both my parents were very faithful uh, Christians. I still remember my mother reading devotionals. My father always, always has a Bible with him, uh, heavily highlighted, and right. just even to this day. So both of them. I was going to say one thing you would say about the Anderson Church of God. I mean, some Protestant denominations have a wide breadth of theologies, liberal, conservative, for want of better terms, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But usually, Anderson Church of God are very very faithful folk. Yeah, absolutely. When I think of that group, a very committed to Christ and, and Scripture and trying to live holy living. And yeah, absolutely. But my parents met there. My, I think all of my aunts and uncles have gone to Anderson University. And, you know, just came from a very faithful home, and they all wanted to go to, to the university that supported that faith. So that's where my parents met and, um, you know, was in Canton for a few years and then moved to Michigan, which is where, where I really grew up. And I grew up with Bible stories and had a real sense of what, you know, what was in the Bible. I'll give you an example. When I was uh, well, maybe six or seven, I was walking home and a bully kind of was bothering me. And I thought of the story of David and Goliath. And I picked up a stone and threw it at him, <laughs> hit him in the forehead. That's what the Bible said. <laughs> he never did it again. And then I went home, just matter of fact, they said, yeah, you know, I understand David and Goliath. <laughs> Uh, in hindsight, I think I could really hurt him, but uh, <laughs> but that was what I was you know, raised in, and I knew. And when I was six years old, my father by then was doing youth ministry, was no longer full time and, and a pastor. He was we were still going to Church of God, but he was doing a day job, uh, working for I believe hospitals, uh, nonprofits, that sort of thing. But he was doing the youth ministry at the church we were at, and the youth were going to be baptized. They're teenagers and. Uh, those who had elected to get baptized were going to. And I said, well, can I get baptized? And that wasn't very common. In fact, I was the only child to get baptized that year. But, you know, asking for it, professing mm -hmm. that desire was really what you needed to do. And after talking with everyone involved, they could see that I really wanted it. So I was baptized uh, October 9th, 1988. Mm -hmm. And my father did it. He's the, he's the one who baptized me, and I still remember it. It's just very important, I think, in hindsight, you know, maybe, you know, it was definitely a Trinitarian baptism, but there was not any, this is the beginning of being truly part of the body of Christ. This, right. it was more a profession of faith. But it was an important step for me, even though I didn't fully understand, I think, what was happening. So at that age, yeah. six, yeah. Yeah. as you look back, mm -hmm. you, you, by God's grace, had mm -hmm. a faith in Christ and a desire to be in union with Him through baptism. There was no doubt in my mind. Yeah. I still remember asking for it and feeling very strongly about it. Uh -huh. And I've always gravitated towards that. I think within a year, uh, I, I tried my hand at painting and I painted a, a crucifix, <laughs> <laughs> which I still have to this day. So maybe foretelling where things were going in the future. Did you, 
I mean, you didn't think of it as a crucifix. You no. just, it, was the, it was the image of Christ on the cross. I mean, exactly. You, right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, we watched the movies. There were quite a few movies in the 70s and 80s that you could watch, right. um, the crucifixion, and uh, it just spoke to me. Um, so it has, has continued to do that. Where was Anderson, Church of God, uh, mm -hmm. and your family at in relationship to the Catholic Church? Uh, was it a part of the discussion? Or? Um, no, not at all. Uh, I had two brief run-ins with the Catholic Church growing up. The first was at a family wedding when somebody from my family was marrying a Catholic woman. And I remember going and not really understanding what the difference was so much. I knew that I didn't know when to stand and <laughs> <laughs> kneel. And half the family continued with the Lord's Prayer to the, <laughs> the doxology was included in that. Um, but I didn't think anything more of it, really. And then the second run-in was I had a friend who was Catholic and I visited him and he was going to Mass and I was a minor, I had to go with him. And it was, it was at a casino, it was just off a casino in Nevada and you went to a side room that was away from the gambling and all that, but I thought this is a strange, strange group of people. <laughs> There's still a sports yeah. ticker going in the back and things like that. Uh, but I really didn't think too much of it. All I knew is that, uh, you know, the Bible was what the, the was everything. Though at one point I recall saying, I will never marry a Catholic. I don't know why that came out. Maybe it was a discussion of this wedding. I just, why would I marry a Catholic? I want somebody who's a Bible believing person. And of course I ended up doing just that. Um, but <laughs> that's to come. <laughs> right. um, so I was, ex I feel like I was very faithful up until maybe 14 or 15. Uh, I would wear a cross openly uh, around my neck in high school, in public high school, mm. carry Bible with me. And people would ask, are you going to be a preacher? I said, I don't know. You know <laughs> just who I am, you know. But what, what really changed in that time period uh, was I started taking classes that were much more antagonistic towards mm. religion as a whole. And the two that stick out in my mind was I took philosophy at you know, public high school, and I took biology. And what I started to get the feeling, maybe subconsciously at first, was that those who have these strong beliefs really can't be too smart. They're duped or something like that. And those who are really smart are materialists. You know, in biology, I remember the first time I heard my teacher say, Darwinian evolution explains everything. And look, the, there are these experiments, you can create proteins and amino acids out of nothing. So it's really just a matter of time before life is created anywhere. And that really was tough for me to deal with. The other thing was to hear, uh, even within my own faith tradition, not everybody said, you know, when we read, we read Jonah, for instance, well, you know, maybe there wasn't a fish. Uh, so I had on the one hand kind of this weakening of thinking, oh, maybe this is all just myth or story. Then on the other hand, you know, taking biology and then a philosophy taught by an atheist. And the first question he asked us is, how many of you believe in a God? And I would say about two thirds to three quarters raised their hands, maybe even a little half embarrassed the way the question was, was yeah, asked. Yeah. And I did, but by the end of the class, I had one of those flagging hands. I wasn't sure if I should raise it anymore. <laughs> Uh, we learned the term agnostic, and oh, that's a smart position where you don't you don't know, so you don't have to believe either way. And so I kind of embraced that title, I think. Uh, and so by the end the end of high school, I was probably an agnostic, at least not knowing. I don't think I ever used the term atheist. I just I thought that was a smart term, and it really was about being smart. And it was all probably also being um, skeptical of the naivete mm -hmm. of the faith that you had been handed to you all those years mm -hmm. and all those folk that were not as well informed right as right. these intellectually uh, superior folk that had bought in or not bought into but it had uh, been taught the darwinian evolution and all that and, mm -hmm. and you want to be with this group, not, not that group. <laughs> i didn't want to be the group that of the people who weren't smart right I, I wanted to be in yeah i wanted to be in the skeptical group the questioning group the ones who supported uh, science, and who doesn't? And I think that's an issue today. Yeah. Teenagers are just being told that's that's where smart people go, and I think a lot of people come to their faith without anything rational. I needed something rational. I needed argumentation, and I really wasn't getting it. 
Um, I think, for instance, in my father's own life, he came to faith through kind of a mystical experience and really saved him from a life on the streets in Indianapolis. He had no question after that, you know, having had a kind of mystical experience. For me, I needed something more. I'd been handed on a faith tradition, but wasn't equipped to deal with these questions I was coming up, uh, was faced with in school. And, you know, I was continuing to go to the Church of God, and I remember right at the end of high school, in my senior year, we, we bounced around a little bit to kind of explore other churches to see maybe we want to go somewhere else, and we went to a mega church called Kensington in Michigan. And it was great, you know, it has theater, it has all the things to draw you in, coffee, um, you know, <laughs> a great time. And I'm sure, you know, very successful in that and faithful people. But I remember the pastor gave a critique of Darwinian evolution, meaning a godless evolution. And I remember just sitting there shredding my bulletin. I was so angry I had to be sitting here listening to what I thought was blather. Uh, and really what it was was a critique of taking God out of evolution. I don't think it went more than that, but that was enough for me to get such such a huff that I remember my father said, you know, why don't you just step out? And I did. Hmm. And I don't think I voluntarily went to church for many years after that. Wow. So that was kind of the end. But there was a mercy on that day, um, even though I was angry and frustrated. Uh, that day we went back to our other church, and I don't remember why, but I didn't want to go in. I was hmm. so upset and frustrated. And so I stayed in the car. And out comes somebody from the church, uh, a man named Rudy Holtz. He's, he was an old German man who had survived World War II in Berlin in the last days of the war, starvation, all sorts of things. And he came in and told me, he originally he was from Ukraine, he was German, but as the war ended, they had moved all towards Germany. So his entire village had been relocated. And he said, you know, I'm getting up in years, I want to go back and meet these people again. Uh, so I would like to go to Europe. Would you like to go with me? And this is, he just came out to the car and asked that. And how did, how did that ever come up? I mean, that's bizarre. It's yeah. very bizarre. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, which was going to be such an important step on my faith journey, but wow. I didn't know that. And I was just excited about that. It distracted me from this whole religion question. So I agreed to go. And so I graduated high school. And a few weeks later, I got to go to, to Europe to kind of drive around and find these people. Of course, he's interested in talking faith with me and opening up questions, and I'm just <laughs> blocking him right and left, putting, head, putting headphones on when I could. Uh, and I remember we did have discussions, and I realized these are questions that need to be asked. I, don't, I didn't think I knew the answers, but I needed to ask those questions. What really struck me, though, when I first got to Europe, the first city we stayed in was Cologne. <laughs> and anybody who's been to Cologne or you know, World Youth Day, I think, was in Cologne at one right. point. You can't help but miss this magnificent cathedral. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing that it made it through all the other destruction of, of the war. Just, just for those listening, Michael yeah. Kress is, is our is our speaker here. Uh, how old was this gentleman? Well, he was a child at the end of the war, so you know, do the math. But right. he was already, I think, around retirement age at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he, here he is way. guiding you through, and yeah. uh, what a great gift that he gave you to take you with. It was with a magnificent wow. gift. Yeah. Wow. So we drove, we drove around, mostly Germany, but you know, ducked into the neighboring countries. And everywhere you turn, there's these magnificent churches. Mm -hmm. And they, you can't help but think, what were these people doing building these, these places? Um, what inspired them to, to come up this you know, giant tower without modern day technology and place these stones here and carve them with care and love? Mm -hmm. So it touched me, and a non -intell it really wasn't intellectual, it was more emotional, I think to start realizing that there are people who did things that were great for God. And when you go into these places, you can't help but feel a certain sense of God. Um, there's just an awe there. So coming back from that trip, uh, I, did, I was not a believer or anything, but something got stirred up. Mm. And for one, I wanted to go back to Europe. Mm. I wanted to learn more about these things and see them. And Part of that was I needed to improve my, my language abilities. And so my freshman year of college, I was in Grand Rapids at the time, at Grand Valley State. I, I decided I was gonna go online and find a language pen pal. And that was gonna help me to improve my German and I could go over there and study or something like that. And another grace, I met my wife. I mean, we ended up marrying 2006, but we met as language pen pals online. So I was practicing my German, she was practicing her English. 
And so for a couple of years where I was just going through school. So she was German? She's German. Oh, yeah. okay. A couple of years, I was practicing every day my German. It was getting much better because when you're motivated to write, <laughs> you get better. And I got to the point where I said, I would feel comfortable if I went to back to Europe for maybe junior year. And my teacher said, you can't go for a semester. You need to go for a whole year. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And I asked my then pen pal, her name is Susanna. Um, I said, which university? I see there are two major programs. There's Munich and Heidelberg. She said, well, I only live about 40 minutes from Heidelberg. And I said, okay, I'll go to Heidelberg. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Heidelberg for my junior year. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's where my- What were you majoring in? I was majoring in uh, history and German. Okay. And I kind of stuck with that track from then on. Yeah. Uh, when you go abroad, one of the things that happens, particularly for a longer period of time, you are removed from all of your connections, your family, your friends. I mean, you can contact them, but your day to day, you're suddenly alone and you have to build new relationships and things like that. And in Europe, you know, I didn't have a car anymore. I had to take public transit, I had to walk a lot. And it was so good because in those quiet moments, God can fill those moments. Mm -hmm. My father, in the meantime, uh, he was always very gentle in suggesting faith to me, um, began sending me care packages. And he would include at least a few religious books in those care packages. And one of those books was Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. And A Case for Christ, I mean, I just ranted and raved that he only said one side of the argument, but A Case for Christ is, is really the story of an atheistic journalist. Yeah asking the, the hard questions and then convincing himself of the faith. And I had never heard anything like apologetics before. I had never heard of a rational argument of any kind for faith. And the one that really sticks with me was the witnesses of the apostles and their martyrdom. Yeah. He said, people will die for a lie, but they won't die for, for something they know to be false. And they were all in a position to know. And I said, maybe I need to revisit this. So I did, and I began reading the books, maybe grudgingly at first, but I was reading them. <laughs> I had time to read them all of a sudden. I didn't have anybody else to spend the time with except the ones I was just getting to know. So I would read in the streetcar, and as I would go to visit Susanna, for instance, I had train rides, and I had to switch at train stations, and I just always had a book with me. So I read, I read enough to really start to get things moving. I don't think I was praying at or anything like that, but it was an important step for me. Um, so I came back in 2003, finished my, my education, and it turns out that I had filed a, a scholarship on the wrong year or something like that. And so a scholarship I'd wanted to have for Germany, I got for the next year. And they said, well, are you gonna take it or not? I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go another year. <laughs> And I, I think it was another grace because it really pulled me back. Mm. Again, I needed more quiet, more solitude, more walking, more reading. And this time it was to Salzburg, Austria. Wow. Which is even farther away than, I mean, I knew some people now in Germany, again, I'm pulled away from everybody, six hours away from my then uh, girlfriend, Susanna. And I would take six hour train rides, you know, once a month or so, at least to visit her we were dating by then and six hours in a train you have to fill that with something so again i just feel like it wasn't just about going to europe which was a great experience but it was also about being able to listen to god hmm. and i think it worked had, had you been during that first time in germany then the second year in germany had you been attending worship at all not at all zero okay. i like i said i still had i went from that experience at kensington until a few years still until I would go. Oh, okay. So with, with the beautiful churches? Mm -hmm. well, I went to the churches. I just didn't go to, to worship. Museums. <laughs> they were museums yes, then in your yes. mind. Yes. Well, history, so it was a great... Wow, what a place to be. Then you have yeah. Salzburg, you have all the Catholic churches right. there, and and uh, still maybe just seeing them as museums, right. but, mm -hmm. uh, but yet intellectually being drawn to the reality of God. Absolutely. Uh, I remember the tour guide said when we were in Salzburg, there are 39 Catholic churches and one Protestant. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but that's what he told us. He's right though, there were Catholic churches everywhere. You bump into, there were Franciscans on the street. You just see them everywhere. It was part of the culture 
over there. And of course, there's the Salzburg Cathedral. And again, as if God is not going to let me go, two things were required of me. One, I needed to study Latin in order to continue to study in Europe. Uh, in Germany, they still require you to have completed a certain level of Latin fluency mm -hmm. to study history and a few other subjects. So I spent that year learning Latin. And while I was learning Latin, the Latin class overlooked the cathedral. So it was right behind the teacher. I literally had to look at the cathedral, <laughs> listening to the teacher talk, uh, one of my Latin classes. So again, it's in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense what was going on at the time. I don't think I consciously recognized that though. Hmm. And as my time in Salzburg drew near to, to, to a conclusion, I think the first time I prayed was in that cathedral uh, since I had lost a real act of faith. And, and I just went in there and kind of said a goodbye to the place and I prayed. And I, don't, I think that was the first and it was, it was definitely the right step for me at the time. Just saying, you know, God, if you're there, I'm here, I kind of sense this, but you know, where do we go from here? Um, so I moved to Germany after that, and uh, by then was engaged to my, uh, to my, I guess, girlfriend, fiance now. And she's a cradle Catholic, but grew up in a very secular yeah. household. Um, I don't think they went to church at all. Uh, they, she went to a Catholic school and that was about it. Would you say of your experience there that that was fairly typical oh, yeah. of the German culture? Yeah, um, since I've been, uh, been back to Germany as a Catholic and have, have seen, uh, one thing I can add in Germany, the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church are directly funded by taxes. And I believe yeah. it's 3% for everybody. And so if you do not wish to pay that tax, you have to formally leave the church you can't get sacraments anymore. And so somebody who was Catholic who came to Germany and didn't want to be part of the church couldn't receive those sacraments. They'd have to go back home. So mm -hmm. I've never really understood how, Crazy. when the state is so entangled in what's going on with religion, you get these problems. So Germany has beautiful churches well maintained that are largely empty. Mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's the culture. You know, they have Catholic holidays. It's really part of the everyday talk, but not as a religious thing. Just that's where we come from. And so she would, you know, she finished her time at the Catholic school and wasn't really interested in worship. I think she was close to where I was on the journey. And thankfully, we went on the journey together uh, mm -hmm. as we got married. So we got married in '06 in Mannheim, Germany, and. It was right around then that we realized we needed to do something. We were both feeling some kind of call to, to Christianity. And that call uh, first took us to an American army base in Heidelberg. Um, at the time, there were quite a few soldiers in Heidelberg, and I was studying there, studying uh, history in German. Mm -hmm. And there were a whole, there was quite a few bases around. I was not an American serviceman, though, so I couldn't get on them. And I really felt strongly, I need to go to an English speaking church, something like what I grew up with. Mm. And there was one church, um, Mark Twain Village Chapel, which was not on base. Uh, you could walk right on into it. And so we started going there together. And it was kind of a non-denominational Protestant worship and the Catholics had it right after us. So the Stations of the Cross were all closed. <laughs> you know, there was a little conversion that occurred, if you've ever been to a military chapel, between Protestant and Catholic. But that was the first time we both actively wanted to go to church, right around when we got married. And we decided we were, we were not just going to get married in the courthouse, which is what we did. We were going to get, have a Protestant wedding back in the States. So half the family came to the one in Germany and then the other half <laughs> was in the States. Um, and we, we returned and we got married in the in American Baptist Church, which was my grandparents' church. Um, it was a little, a little awkward because I said, we're married and we shouldn't, you know, give away bride away or anything like that. So we walked down the aisle together, but we wanted God to bless our marriage. We just, we just didn't know exactly how to do that. So we had our, we had our wedding then and we continued on the faith journey together. Uh, Mark Twain Village Chapel turned out to be another grace for us because 
A woman from there saw us and said, would you like to come to a small group meeting? And we had enough hunger at that time to say, yeah, let's, let's do that. Well, they met every week, um, which I have not found to be as common in the Catholic world, meeting every single week to do a Bible study. <laughs> but uh, they were really serious about Bible study. And we came to the small group and we studied the book of Daniel. I remember it was the first one we studied. And every week there was fellowship and you were surrounded by people who really believed. Hmm. And it was so much nourishment for us to see smart people having in, you know, this discussion about the Bible. That was transformative. So we were in that group for a few years. And it was just people you know, going off base to a, someone's home, to a civilian home. Americans? Americans, Americans. all Americans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was never in the military, but got to know a lot of servicemen that way. And they plugged us in. They would take us on base to go to chapel at Patrick Henry and other places in Heidelberg. And I think just as much as the intellectual, I mean, I could tell you about some of the books I read and C.S. Lewis was big, but really surrounding ourselves by faithful people. The fellowship, the communion. Was, yeah. was really important. Well, um, so we continued to do that and we continued to read the Bible. We started reading the Bible together. We did one of those Bible in a Year things, which are really popular. And just, I had this desire to grow deeper in faith. And I remember asking, once you're in, once you've said, I give my life to you, what's, th what's the next thing you do? Hmm. There was a real emphasis on getting people to that point, you know, give your life to Christ, which is an incredible first step. But what do you do after that? Do you read this book or that book, or how do you continue to grow? And I remember having that, that question many times. Well, I'm here, I've arrived, but there's so much I need to learn. Uh, I'm thinking we'll pause there yeah. at that time because you've actually hit a wonderful question, uh, even outside of our, of our journey home discussion, because so many Protestant churches, because of their theology, they have that initial commitment to surrender to Jesus Christ, accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and there you are. And many of them, it's now you're saved. Now what? <laughs> and now what? You know, now yeah. what? I've been to some churches where every Sunday, that's really all that they do. Every Sunday, have an altar call. Mm -hmm. But now what? And, and that's the big question you're dealing with, important question. All right, we'll come back to that. Come back just a moment for our guest, Michael Kress. See you a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest tonight is Michael Kress. And uh, I interrupted you, and then you're, you're dealing with that question. So you're going to a Bible study run by American servicemen right. away from home, mm -hmm. but themselves seeking a deeper walk with Christ, and they're, they brought your German wife yeah. and you in, into mm -hmm. that. And the question you're raising is with the emphasis on coming to Christ, but not what? Now what? Yeah, I think their their answer to that was to read the Bible more and to study it. And that's a good step. I mean, it's not the only step, but it's a good step. And so I remember we took our first year was a walk through Daniel at a very slow pace, but in great depth. Uh, a little bit like your show, you know, deep in Scripture, you yeah. could just take it a chapter at a time, you know, a chapter a month even, and really dig into it. So we did that, and it was great. What happened though was, though we were we were definitely growing in our faith, we were searching for that next step. And for me, I'm, I was recalling that baptism I mentioned a little while ago. And I remember there were some adults who got baptized. And I, and I remember asking, um, why are they getting baptized, not just the teenagers? And the answer was, oh, they're getting baptized again because they have recommitted their life to Christ. And that stuck with me. <laughs> And so as a Protestant seeking that next step in the deeper conversion, I thought, well, maybe I should be baptized again. <laughs> I didn't understand the theology of baptism. I just wanted to profess my faith publicly. So I talked to the chaplain, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, who was also a pastor, and he said, sure, no problem. Uh, he was uh, 
a version of Pap Baptist, I think out of Virginia, Liberty Baptist or something like that. It didn't matter to me at all. It really didn't. And so, you know, we got signed onto the base to go get a baptism done. And uh, I was baptized a second time. And it was meaningful still. It was a profession mm -hmm. and I was, you know, doing my best to try to find God. And yet I still wanted to know what's the next step after that. You know, I was looking for a game plan. This is what you do and then this, and then you can grow in this area. And it was around that time that we finished school. My, my wife graduated uh, with her English degree and wanted to do library science. And I had my history master's and wanted to go do some more. And I, I thought, why don't I do German? I've been in Europe for seven years at that point. Why don't I study German in the States? Should be easy, right? Well, we found a program we could both get accepted to, and that was the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And we, we left Germany and have been here since. And my wife started her library science program, and it was a good program for her. But for me, uh, I was studying German. I was not prepared for the, uh, the antagonism to religion that I found among student body, staff, mm -hmm. And I should back up, in Europe, when you get a master's degree in anything, there's much more this attitude, you're out to study on your own, we'll be here to test you at periods, and you know whether you show up for the lectures is completely up to you. If you want to read instead, you can do that, but you have to pass certain requirements here and there. So there's a very hands-off approach. And in the States, it's not hands-off. I would say it's definitely hands-on, almost guiding you through all these things you need to do. So I had had all the space to investigate my faith. In fact, I had had the freedom. I ended up writing a, my master's thesis on the Puritans and how they saw weather and climate and whether God was really in the winds as an angry force or, or a way to show providence. I had had space to do that, even though clearly, you know, Europe, I didn't feel was, was very faithful. It didn't matter specifically to me at that moment. When I got to the University of Illinois as a PhD student in German, I was not prepared for a critical theory, which was really based on Karl Marx and Hegel and all the people who have built their ideas from those, from those seeds. And I didn't care for it at all. Uh, so I did all the classwork, but I had this real coming to, I don't know, coming to Jesus moment isn't the right thing. I had already believed strongly in Christ before I got into the program, but I had to decide, why am I doing this anymore? Hmm. If I'm going to hold out, it's just to get a, a PhD, and yet I feel like I'm suffocating faith-wise here. And we were bouncing around to all the churches in Urbana-Champaign looking for one. When we had been at, in, in Heidelberg, there wasn't any denomination to choose from. It was Protestant or Catholic, and it was obvious to us. There you go. <laughs> And now we had to choose, are we going to Presbyterian, Episcopal, Baptist, which version of each of those, uh, Church of Christ. I mean, even in a small community, fairly small community, it was a hard choice. So we were not finding a place to really settle in Urbana-Champaign. And at the same time, I was feeling very stifled. So I decided I was going to finish my coursework and then be done and not do the dissertation. And it was about this time because uh, there was only a certain number of courses that were offered, uh, I had to fill a slot. And I just wanted something that wasn't antagonistic in my mind towards, towards Christ and religion. And I found a class called Catholic Thought 501, taught by Dr. Ken Howell. Turned out to be his very last semester there. Yeah. Um, he had had, I think, a hard time of it just being a faithful Catholic right. uh, at the university and knew that it was, it was coming to an end. I, I was aware that there had been some issues, but I really didn't know what. I just wanted a class, even if it was a Catholic class, that wasn't going to make this situation worse than it had been. So I took the class, and I remember going in there saying, well, at least it's about Christ in some way. You know, we're going to maybe have the Bible out or something like that. And I wasn't prepared for it. I was the, I may have been the only Protestant, or maybe there were two, and there were about 40 Catholics in the class. Um, it was just a room full of Catholics talking Catholic language, Catholic <laughs> <laughs> theology. And I realized I had never encountered it, really. It, my whole life, I'd never really looked at it. And Dr. Ken Howell is incredible at not just um, giving you the answers, but making you dig yourself, hmm. asking you that question. 
he talked about the early church fathers. I mean, we had never talked about the early church fathers. I didn't even think there were documents going back to that time. And, you know, we looked at the Didache. You could look at Irenaeus and I like, felt like we are missing something. And as a student of history, I realized I had not examined why I was a Protestant, how for 1500 years plus there weren't any Protestants and how I fit into that. So that, that raised a lot of questions for me. And at the same time, I had a faithful Catholic friend who was also in library science, a friend of my wife's at first, who invited us to mass. And she, it was at the Newman Center in I think uh, Urbana-Champaign there. Mm -hmm. And it was a candlelight mass, they, no lights, if I recall, it was just candles everywhere. And it was beautiful. And I had this longing, I was sitting up in the balcony, had this longing to go down and participate. But I knew I couldn't. I was afraid of being found out. <laughs> yes. This guy's not a, a Catholic here. But that invitation to come to Mass, that's the first one I had had. So combining Dr. Howell with my friend Lisa, Lisa Krakoberg, her, invite, her invitation and his intellectually feeding me, I realized how deep the Catholic faith was. There wasn't just this focus on initial conversion. There was a process of conversion, and then there was mystagogy and all these other steps afterwards. And I couldn't get enough of it. So at that moment, I was very tempted to join RCIA right away. And I remember I wrote an email and I didn't want to send it and I wasn't sure. I was very conflicted because it wasn't my background. And I ended up saying, I'm not ready for this. Uh, you know, I don't agree with all their teachings. I didn't understand all the teachings. What's this with Mary and things like that. And we finished our schooling. And I said, I have this hunger. I've learned to love liturgy, for instance. Mm. I have this hunger for a deeper connection to the histor historical past. So when we moved to Missouri, where I'm in St. Louis now, kind of a halfway step for me was the Episcopal Church. It was a place with, with history and liturgy, a beautiful liturgy, great singing. And so I joined that church. Um, they had, you know, I'm not sure their exact theology of the Eucharist, actually, now that I think about it. But it was important to them. They did it every Sunday. It wasn't right. twice a year <laughs> or something like that. You know, there was something important about it. But it was really only a temporary stop into the Catholic Church. And one day I was a Sunday school teacher uh, about a year into being Episcopal. And my wife and I, uh, we showed up and there was nobody in the class for the teenagers. Uh, so we decided instead of just sitting here for an hour, let's drive around and just kill some time. And then we'll come back for, for church. And something struck us like a ton of bricks. It was the Epiphany in 2013. And said, why don't we try the Catholic Church? We kind of said it at the same moment. And I, don't, I was filled with a little bit of trepidation, I have to say, going to it. <laughs> we just decided to skip church that day and go to a Catholic Mass instead. And we went to it, and it was, it was beautiful. It was touching. Again, I felt like I was going to be found out. But <laughs> within a week, I said, we need to, I want to pursue it now. I want to look into it and get these questions answered. And she said, me too. I want to go back. I want to go home. <laughs> I don't know how the timing, how it's possible that we went from two people really without a faith to at the same moment wanting to investigate the Catholic Church again. Mm -hmm. So we went into RCIA and, you know, by January, they're already way into RCIA and they're saying, well, normally you'd have to wait till next year. And I said, I, you know, I believe the Eucharist, I have a, would have a hard time waiting come in. And I said, by the way, I took Dr. Ken Howell's class. And they said, what was it called? Catholic Thought 501. They said, well, that we can count that as the first part of our <laughs> uh, And in the end, I felt like what I learned in his class was so much more than I learned in RCA anyway, right, right. Uh, that it was perfect. And we were able to come in in the Easter Vigil 2013. Well, I came in in 2013 and my wife was my sponsor. She she came back. She said, I'm afraid of confession. It's been so long. We had a great priest. And he said, I'll take you through it. And she had you know, a great confession and was able to be my sponsor. And we were suddenly back. Uh, we were, I mean, she was back and I was in that church and I felt so fed from the moment on. The Eucharist, confession, I, I wondered how I ever lived without those things. <laughs> and I realized there was a depth here that I could really uh, plumb and get deep into. And that's where I've been since. Uh, I will add as well that not, within two weeks of becoming Catholic, I found out that I was not going to continue on as being a teacher. I was a teacher at the time. 
it was not going to be they were not going to want me back it was a very progressive school and I was going to mass in my free hours and things like that and <laughs> it just wasn't a good fit it was totally fine to do that but you know a practicing Catholic amongst you know a very different world view uh, and so we, we parted on good terms I think and I finished on my contract and I started I ended up working for the Archdiocese uh, I work at a parish Most Holy Trinity which is one of the largest churches in St. Louis used to be called the Cathedral of the North and have worked to raise money for them to uh, we founded Mass Mob St. Louis mm -hmm. which is where we invite people to come to these gorgeous inner city churches that have millions of dollars worth of stained glass windows relics beautiful things to support them and help them to try to stay open wow. um, and in addition I have had the privilege of also being in charge of evangelization there so we do St. Paul Street evangelization um, so it has been a big change in life I mean from even a few years ago I've only been three years now Catholic officially but I have not had any of the restlessness where hmm. we would go for a few weeks to different churches and say oh I don't like this I don't like this and realizing that the Catholic Church could not just provide the sacraments but real food for intellectually and have just been so happy to be back there since uh, yeah. let's assume uh, listening to your story as a former Church of God friend yeah. uh, okay what, what was the hardest or one of the hardest barriers to get over from your transition from Church of God, I'm bringing agnostic mm -hmm. Episcopal to the Catholic Church. Sure. And then what was the mm -hmm. one of the biggest drawing points that you'd like to share? The, I think there, there is no creed in the Church of God. We don't, at least I, we never recited one. I, mm -hmm. I think they're, they just said, this is the creed and they point to the Bible, right? And the, probably the biggest issue was, first of all, when you read it on your own, you're your own authority. So if you want to read the Bible specifically for a, for a point, you can do that. And you can probably find what you're looking for if you look hard enough. Or, you know, look, take this passage out of context and this one. Um, In fact, uh, I'm thinking, yeah. imagine, uh, it's hard for me to, cross, to get my, wrap my mind around spending yeah. a month studying Daniel. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to study Daniel for a month, you're bringing in a lot of ideas, yeah. a lot of opinions mm -hmm. uh, on prophecy and what it means and how it applies. I mean, you can get a lot out of that, sure. and a lot of it might not be exactly in line with what the author intended. <laughs> True. Well, and within the group, there's disagreement. That's part of it. You just accept it, and then you try to focus on the parts we do agree on. Yeah. Um, but coming from the Church of God, in where we didn't have a creed, worship was, uh, you know, there's no altar or anything like that, but... There's prayer, there's a homily. It's not completely foreign. It's just the Catholic parts have been removed, the specifically right. Catholic parts. Probably the biggest thing, uh, number one, uh, is some of the Catholic doctrines and understanding that there was a historic church that had confronted these issues from the beginning. I never really thought there was much of a historic church. I thought there were communities that met in homes and that's all they did. I didn't really realize there were bishops from the beginning and there were fathers of the church and they're writing on these issues and then realizing I have missed out and how am I going to, for instance, Mary, I'll give an example. Mary was one, um, I didn't know what to do with Mary even when I first came to the church. <laughs> how does she fit into it? So I spent a lot of time reading about it, but really I had a spiritual director who said, that's probably the part you should work on the most because this is an important part of Catholic teaching that she's you know, our spiritual mother, mother of all of us. And so he just led me through it, through De Montfort consecration, through just reading Mary things on Mariology. And I realized, oh, it makes sense. It's actually Christocentric. It's pointing always at Christ. And once I finally saw that you could not be interested in these doctrines, I mean, these doctrines all were pointing to Christ, that I felt, felt comfortable suddenly because Christ is, was at my center. And I said, well, this is just another way to Christ. Uh, a very special way, as it turns out. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there was confession in the Church of God. No, nor in the Episcopal Church I went to. Uh, we never made a, I never made a single confession in the Episcopal Church. They said, you can go to confession if you want. Some of us should, but you don't have to. Um, that actually, if I could say one more thing about the Episcopal Church, one of the major reasons that I was dissatisfied and was interested in the Catholic Church was, uh, and I had only been Episcopal for a year, like I said, the 
the pastor said, he could tell I was an on fire for Christ person, and he said to uh, some delegates who came to visit who were on their way to Indianapolis for their, every three years they have a big conference and they make decisions about mm -hmm. doctrine. He said, these are gonna be our next ones going probably. Uh, pointing to my wife and to me uh, because we were faithful people. And I thought that you're gonna send me maybe in three years to go and vote on whether this is moral or immoral, sinful or not, what should be permitted in the Episcopal Church. I'm not, I'm a lay person. I mean, I'm learning my faith, but I'm not qualified to make those decisions. So I, I felt that was a problem. The Church of God avoided all of that by not really having any creed besides the Bible. So if you had a disagreement, you could say, well, let's talk scripture. Um, in the Episcopal Church, they had a formal process, but I was feeling uncomfortable because what if I made a mistake and said, this is okay and it isn't? You know, I should be held accountable for that. Newman has that wonderful statement at the, in the introduction to his essay on the development of doctrine in which he says, and we've all heard the statement, mm -hmm. that to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Mm -hmm. Would that describe your journey? Absolutely. Uh, it wasn't the only thing for me. It was just realizing that there was a history, period, uh, that you could look these up. And I didn't have to look up too many before I was convinced something was deeply missing in my faith experience up to this point. We are one body of Christ, not a 20th century body of Christ and a 21st century, one body of Christ. And I, I remember thinking somebody who was in the second, third century would not feel at all comfortable where I am now in the Protestant church. They would have been looking for Eucharist. They would have been looking for bishops. And we had mostly praise and worship music, <laughs> which, which has its place and it's important to worship and praise. but really felt like many of the churches I went to had become praise and worship and sermon and prayer probably in there too. And that was the whole liturgy. You can't tell, you can't read the Didache or other documents, you know, historically speaking, and say, this is the same church. Uh, so. Right. We have an email, Megan from Carmel, Indiana writes, one of the intriguing things about the Catholic Church is its beauty and majestic nature from the cathedrals to art to music and its holy saints and its long historical tradition. Do you think these things might make someone more open to the Catholic faith and conversion? Yes, it did for me. It opens up the first, it's like cracking a door open. And I kept wanting to slam it shut. But you, when you go into, for instance, uh, even in the United States, we have some really beautiful churches. Uh, but Europe was just everywhere. You couldn't turn around without running into one. And when you go in there and spend time, any time just sitting quietly, maybe putting away the camera and sitting in a pew, that does something to you. Uh, it's kind of this feeling of the sublime. There's something greater than you. And you see that um, that's probably one of the areas where I think we should, we should refocus on building beautiful churches. Mm -hmm. We have built many churches that I don't feel at all uplifted in, and I would, I would think that there's some universal things that lift us up to the greatness of God, and the building is supposed to kind of reflect that reality. Yeah. And so you see many buildings that don't do that. Um, but cathedrals, go to Europe. If you go to Europe and just spend time in those cathedrals, I think it will have an effect. Yeah. Well, and I remember seeing the Cologne Cathedral and, yeah. and of course, uh, the other cathedrals of Europe when I was there. And you know, they what they represent to me is a virtue that we've pretty much lost in our culture, that I think the devil had a very mm. powerful hand in the 20th century of uh, divesting our culture yeah. from, and that's the virtue of patience. You, you see in the, the building of those cathedrals, the patience that must have been there in the craftsmen, mm -hmm. that uh, it, it isn't just the big statues, but it's the intricate, yeah faces and saints and the gargoyles mm -hmm. that the devotion of these craftsmen placed in a position on the cathedrals that they knew no one would ever see again except yeah. God himself. Mm -hmm. that, that virtue we've lost. Yeah. So if we're going to build again, we have to recapture the virtue of patience and humility mm -hmm. and gratitude to the providence of God. Absolutely. If you I don't know if you climb the towers, they go up and up and forever they go up. And then you go on a catwalk and then you're even further and you'll right, you'll turn a corner and you'll see the most obscure but ornate, beautiful, maybe a statue or this or that. And you just think, wow, who, these people are up here. I'm terrified in within the confines of the tower. They're outside putting the, you know, chiseling and putting these in place. 
these are people who are willing to risk their life for God, even, you know, not martyrdom, but falling off uh, the cathedral to make something beautiful that will draw people up towards God. And they do that. You can't help yeah. if, but to have that happen to you. And, and yeah. in a way that they never even thought they'd see the, the completion of the cathedral. Right. I think the, the cathedral of Cologne took about 600 years because they ran out of money. And then, the, you know, a few generations later, they continued. Uh, we build church. We don't build churches so much like that anymore, though there are churches here in the United States that are like that. And they are in need of, of support to keep them open. And they're sadly closing one after the other. They become either they're bulldozed or they're just left there empty. And I think that we, we really need to remember art is a way that can bring people to God. And so when I even go to art museums, art that doesn't draw me closer to God uh, is generally, it's not as interesting to me. This decadent art and things like that yeah. doesn't do it for me at all. Yeah, I, I can think of two recent cathedrals yeah. I've been in. Beautiful, and I highly recommend them. There's the, the cathedral in Toledo, Ohio. It's a beautiful cathedral. Mm -hmm. And the cathedral in Newark, New Jersey, where we were there for Father Granite, Benedict Grishel's funeral. Beautiful places. Mm -hmm. And that's just two that I've been to recently, and I encourage everyone to go. And, and as you said, we need to support the church in these because uh, yeah. the upkeep, of course, on these wonderful works of art. I got another email, Justin from Colorado. I was raised a Christian, but fell away from practicing any faith around college. I've had some difficult things happen in my life that makes me question the goodness of God, mm -hmm. if He even exists. Do you think Christianity has what I need? Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But, uh, I didn't get much into the apologetics. I think many of your guests have, are really great apologists. To me, I needed to hear some uh, apologetics in order to break this idea that the material world is all there is. And once you do that, I mean, look up, I would encourage the emailer to look up some of the Eucharistic miracles in the church. Yeah. Oh, that's all I think it would have taken. I would. I didn't know that that's something I could look at, but then looking at, there is even scientific evidence that supports kind of the spiritual reality that goes beyond our comprehension. So I would definitely encourage that. And I would also say that there isn't any one of us who doesn't have suffering or negative things happen in our lives. That's not because of a lack of God's goodness, but of his love and his free will. And there are magnificent apologists you can read up on. And if you haven't, just assuming you know the answer, that's what I did. I assumed I, that I had it all figured out. And then to, you know, Ken Howell and others to, to provide those answers from that perspective, uh, or even from a Catholic perspective, for instance, a, a Protestant objection, you know, oh, Jesus had brothers and all these things, and clearly there was no ever Virgin Mary. Well, Okay, you can think that and read the Bible, and there's a way you can read it and assume that. But you have to ignore 2,000 years worth of history and really good writers on that that have good answers for that. You know, one book that comes to mind uh, in relationship that you're yeah. talking about is Dr. Peter Kreft mm -hmm. has a book on Christian apologetics. And, mm -hmm. and I think in that book, particularly it comes to mind, he deals with the initial apologetics about God, mm -hmm. about Christ, and the one you talked about, the, the witness of the apostles, was one that right. brought me out of secular uh, humanism back in college, too. The reality of these men allowed themselves to die when they knew yeah. whether or not he truly had resurrected mm -hmm. from the dead. And one thing just to mention to the audience, uh, if you go to the Coming Home Network website, chnetwork.org, I'm pretty sure we have on there a, uh, a, a detailed list of good books, many of which you can get on EWTN Religious Catalog, that deal with the very questions that Michael was dealing with in his own journey. Yeah, uh, somebody listen in there uh, from the Church of Christ, yeah. what would you say? Why, why should he make the same journey home you did? I, he, he should make the journey home because it is the fullness of the faith. And I know everyone says that, but there is a fullness. There is, you don't realize what you're missing until you get it. And for instance, the Eucharist alone, or Chesterton would say, confession alone <laughs> is a reason to come back. Uh, if you if you read your Bible, just take the New Testament even, and just go through the Gospel and read uh, all of them, and assume you don't know from your own faith traditions what does he mean in John six about uh, the bread of life, and what are other possible interpretations? You realize there are a thousand ways you could read that, and when you realize that there is something deep there, you need it. You need that faith. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks on, for having me on the journey home and. Uh, 
in your own. It, it, it was, it's good. You also reflect, helped us realize around the other side of the world that, that there are cultures that are really struggling with their faith. We need to pray for them, for our brothers and sisters over there. Mm -hmm. But thank you for your witness to us today. Thanks for having thank me. You. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Michael's journey is an encouragement to you, encouragement to appreciate the gifts of the church that you have. That sometimes we take for granted, they're right there. Let's appreciate them because they're there to draw us closer to Christ. God bless you. See you next week.